<clears throat> so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining us today in this seminar, the last of the year. It's our uh, pleasure to, to host today Caroline Fruit. Sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, she got uh, her PhD in, in physics uh, with a specialization in astronomy uh, from the University of Bern in Switzerland. And then he, he moved to the States where he did um, a postdoc in the National Research Council, uh, well, in the, in the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, and then in Texas University, and now she's associate professor at the University of Purdue, where um, she's the director of the Optical Ground Station, for Purdue Optical Ground Station, and the chair of the Committee of a Space Research Panel on Potentially Environmentally Detrimental Activities in Space. Um, her research and expertise are focused on space situational awareness and space domain awareness, including uh, optical observations, multi-target tracking and detection, information theory, machine learning, low ob observability systems, and object characterization. So, thanks again for being here. Uh, well, her talk is entitled a Space Domain Awareness in This Lunar Space, Optical Surveillance and Object Characterization via Light Curves. So, floor is yours, Caroline. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for the um, uh, invitation here and um, that I can present. And uh, feel free to um, interrupt me at any time when things are not clear or if you have questions. This is, I want this to be a dialogue rather than a monologue. Okay, so let's uh, jump right in. So uh, my outline, we'll do a bit of an introduction and then um, I'll go into the topic of astrodynamics, we we'll look a bit at fragmentation and uh, surveillance and then uh, characterization and I have some conclusions in the end. So as the introduction, I mean, this is no surprise to uh, many of you here, space is a crowded place and the nearer space is populated like never before. We had the CubeSat uh, revolution and new commercialization of uh, space. And what is in the video is um, kind of what's in the TLE catalog and the tool and element catalog of the 18th Space Command at the moment. And you see in, in red the kind of the near Earth objects and then in green are the objects which are further out than the geostate synchronary belt. And this is... Thank you. So there is a new push into cislunar space. Um, what is that region? That's the region denoting uh, between the Earth and the lunar region. Usually we say cislunar starts beyond uh, geo and um, all the way up to the moon and in the entire uh, plane there. And there are new scientific missions. We all have seen Artemis and what is coming there. Um, there's new commercialization potential and there's also increased defense interest in that region. So we will see a lot more traffic in that region. And as you can see here, this is not something for the future. This has already started. And if we are not getting um, ahead with our solutions, we will be uh, late to the game. You see all the, all the green objects in there and they are not gone. They are just going to become uh, more and more. So the cis-lunar regime, if you are a person like me coming from the nearest space, is very different because we have that um, large, low acceleration region between the Earth and the Moon, and a lot of it um, is, is possible in that low acceleration uh, region, leading to kind of a plethora of, I start them off, plethora of different orbits that are possible in that regime well um, outside the grasp of the two-body um, regime. So we have to kind of um, expand our minds in that sense of what we can do in that region. And if we are trying to um, explore it, it's also a vast parameter space that we cannot explore um, brute force um, anymore. So we have to keep that in mind. So with that introduction, let's take a look at the astrodynamics. So here, I'm going to uh, bring the Lyapunov orbit just as an example. I have a DRO later just to uh, show some of the, um, some of the things that are, that are possible there. So in the Earth-Moon rotating frame, that's how it looks like. The colors are the different um, Jacobi constants, the different energy levels. You see the uh, Lagrange points um, penciled in here. And then in kind of regular J2000 inertial frame, that's how it looks. And you see in gray the, the lunar um, orbit and the Earth. So 
if you take our example, the happen of orbit, kind of the, the black one that, that I penciled out here, let's see, okay, if we're doing propagation here, in general, we um, say in the Earth-Moon region, we have two popular propagation mo methods. We have the ephemeris model, which is kind of high fidelity model with your usual stuff, Earth-Moon, spherical expansion, Jupiter, solar radiation pressure, near-Earth drag, and so on. Um, you can use uh, NASA SPICE toolkit for the, for the planet position. If you want to be most precise, you get the J2000 ECI coordinate frames, and it's um, computationally expensive. But that's kind of the same propagator we use often in the newer space if you're not using two-body motion. And then the other one, um, I can look into that in more detail, circular restricted three-body problem. That's, of course, less accurate, but it's a lot more efficient. We still have to numerically integrate it, but um, it's still a lot faster. And um, that is computed in the rotating reference frame and often, or it's a non-dimensional system you can dimensionalize later. So just as a um, quick recap, I'm sure you're already familiar with this, the circular restricted three-body problem. So we have the barycenter. It's really inside the Earth, but here for illustration, I pulled it out quite a bit. So we have the Earth, we have the, the Moon, we have the spacecraft of interest. You say the spacecraft basically doesn't have any uh, significant mass compared to the two. We move them on circular orbits around the barycenter, then we can define our non-dimensional constants here. And we are getting our um, governing differential equations. Again, we still have to numerically integrate them, but they are um, a lot uh, faster than the, than the um, full equations. So taking the full ephemeris model, um, what I just brought just to, to show is kind of an uncertainty. Uh, it's not really an analysis, it's just an illustration. 10 meters, 10 meters per second, Gaussian uncertainty, pure ballistic, no maneuvers, and it's just uh, particle 1,000 runs. Uh, just putting that on the Lyapunov orbit is just really an illustration of what's happening here. So that's our nice Lyapunov orbit. We are in the J2000 frame, and you see the different colors are just the different particles from that initial orbit determination. And you see in this very different space, you see what's happening is that entire hemisphere is now accessible just from the volume of the uncertainty um, that, 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 you, um, that we started out with. And this is just 30 days. This is not an extraordinary long amount of time, which is about the, the period of the initial orbit. If we're, so if you're looking at uh, kind of projections in the x, y, um, x, z, and um, the remaining directions, you see, okay, after 10 days, it's not too bad kind of more or less Gaussian, a bit streaked here. Um, after 20 days, you're actually seeing those loopy structures. So the days of um, uh, just having a single Gaussian um, appro approximating that are definitely over. And then after 30 days, again, which is just uh, uh, one, one period, more or less, we have those loopy structures that come in. Okay, so we see the, the uncertainty behavior even over relatively short time spans is increasingly um, complex here. And uh, what that means is there's also a lot possible in those, in those orbits as we have all those regions available, which uh, if they're in the uncertainty, it also means they are accessible through small maneuvers. So we can make very rapid changes or end up in a very different region of space um, with um, basically no effort. But it also means if we are not um, tracking our own position very closely, we can, might, might not easily find our spacecraft again after uh, quite a short amount of time. So what then does that mean if we have a fragmentation in that regime? Therefore, I did it in the circular restricted three-body problem just because we have many fragments and we can run that a bit um, faster, but we have validated that, of course, and it's reasonably close. And um, for this analysis, um, we use the NASA standard breakup model as a, as a baseline, but we made a um, couple of changes. Um, we introduced the, the impulse and mass conservation into the NASA standard breakup model. We assumed the uniform velocity distribution in the directionality and um, a bridging function, bridging the fragmentation size gap, which is um, in, in, the, um, in the original 
model, and it's uh, similar developments which also ESA has done in their um, application of the um, NASA standard breakup model. Okay, so what we want to do is to look at um, uh, different cases. So we take a fragmentation type, which is an explosion. We have a spacecraft. We say it's reasonably sized, 300 kilograms. It's not too big. And um, make our length limit kind of five centimeter to, to one meter. So we're leaving out one of the, a couple of the smallest one. And then the propagation time is just uh, one month again, 30 days. So with our uh, Lyapunov, again, kind of in the L L1 family here, um, you see the different colors are different energy level, and we just say, okay, if they are exploding here at those um, at those points in the orbit on the different energy levels, how does that look like? Okay, and then if we are having if you're propagating that just for one month, that's the picture we are getting. Okay, so you see how how when we have um, the velocities which are bigger than the initial uncertainty I, I, I showed, um, we're getting this widespread, especially from that blue orbit, which is the one with, with the, the largest outline um, to begin with. So we see the, the, the objects are cast out far into the deep space from that initial fragmentation within a short amount of time. We're staying relatively focused in plane. We have a few out of plane components. And then um, we also see there's a, a distribution here, the, the blue one, which is dominating, and then the other ones, the smaller orbits, are a bit more concentrated, at least. And then um, we are, we're still traveling kind of five radii from the breakup um, point. So there's a large range of fragment locations, and um, not all orbits, um, unsurprisingly, produce fragments that travel at the same distances, but you're getting quite unlucky. Uh, here already. So if we're taking that, that bigger orbit and just say, okay, what happens if we have different locations at which we're um, exploding along the orbit? Does that have a, a large effect? The, the Floquet um, criterion for the entire period is, is um, the same. So um, we see what, what happens here. So that would be the picture here, um, just with the colors now indicate the different locations on the orbit, so we see kind of the, the orange here, which is kind of very prominent, and then the, the blue ones, the different blue colors over here. So we still get uh, 2.7 million kilometers out here. Um, and what is notably, the fragments, we'll see that in the other plot in a second, approach much nearer to Earth. We have a few that are going out of plane significantly, so we're not always restricted to that and um, most of them remain planar. And what we're seeing here, i bring that on the next slide again, we have basically, this is a binning of how many fragments do we have per space bin, and we're getting a big bin um, at the original fragmentation location, and then we're getting a second bin actually, um, which, which is in the near-Earth region. Try to um, split that up here a bit more. Okay, this has colors, doesn't, doesn't come out very well with, with the colors. Okay, so here we have the, the distance the fragmentation travels from the breakup point. You see, okay, we have this bimodal distribution. Many of them stay relatively close by, and this kind of distance relative to the, to the Earth, and this kind of where you see that second well. Um, and if we're zooming in here, sorry, it doesn't come out with the colors very, very well. Um, we're seeing this region is capturing. This is, this is geo. Okay. So we have a, a fragmentation event out at, uh, at the Lagrange point at one run of the middle up and off orbit, and we're getting fragments which are interacting with our near-Earth regime. And this is not, uh, not a fluke. We've run many tests, and it's a, it's a consistent pattern that we're getting. And uh, we hadn't looked at re-entry, but we looked at, okay, um, interaction with the satellites which are near Earth. So it's no, no longer a regime we can just ignore and say, okay, we don't have to care about. So if you say these things are happening now, how can we establish surveillance for that region? Well, what are the um, capabilities that we have at the moment and how can we um, expand upon them? So if you're talking um, sensors, I usually work with optical sensors because they're kind of cheap and readily available. So what we are then relying on is the um, irradiation from the object. You get a, a 
it's sh uh, shone upon by the sun, and then depending on the shape of the object and the um, surface materials, you get the reflection with it. And we use a very simple BLEF model here. You can have a more complicated one if you want. So this kind of bit better illustration as the satellite is kind of changing its orientation towards the observer and towards the sun. Um, we're getting different um, irradiation from the object, and then that determines what can our sensor see or not. Of course, we are kind of in that regime where we're almost getting no right light reflected. Our sensor will have a hard time. So the other thing, if you want to observe, are of course the other constraints. So um, if you have a very bright moon, if you have ever done um, uh, astronomical observations during full moon is kind of quite a pain um, because the, I don't know, the moon is kind of blocking out a large portion of the sky, making it very bright. So with our sensor measurements, this kind of on the, on the log scale, we have our moon model, um, which then also depends on full moon or half moon. And then we have kind of the block out region and, and kind of um, tailing, tailing that out. And um, of course, you also have a, a sky background. If you're um, ground-based on the Earth, if you're close to uh, Madrid, it's a lot um, brighter than if you're in more rural parts. And then you have what, what your sensor is capable of. I'm, I'm not going into details here. It, of course, depends on uh, your aperture size, on, on which type of um, sensor you're, you're using. So you say, okay, magnitudes realistically, and what we have nowadays is between 14 and 20. 20 is kind of already good location, kind of one meter aperture, for example. And then, of course, you're sensitive to the signal to noise, which goes back to the sky background, that you're saying, okay, the, the signal of the object has to be somewhat um, above the noise uh, that you're observing. Of course, we can do stacking, and then you, you get a bit better signal-to-noise ratio. That's not always available, especially if you're not sure exactly what objects we are looking at. So we're doing kind of a, a really low threshold here, kind of a more or less theoretical minimum without stacking is, okay, that the, the, the signal is above the noise it creates itself, and then we're getting to that signal over to uh, a square, square root term here. Okay, so those would be our, it's a very simple sensor model, we can go higher fidelity, but that's not the point here, and say, okay, we're taking two run-of-the-mill orbit, the one you already know, this is our good friend, the Leopold of orbit, or we're taking the distant retrograde orbit, we say I have a sun avoidance angle, we say the moonlight magnitude must be higher than the object magnitude, higher magnitude means fainter, and then we say we have a pretty good telescope, and you're making a very, very simple model, a spherical model. Spherical is kind of nice, because if you're not in opposition, you always see something of the spherical object, so it's kind of a good baseline case. If you're not seeing the spherical object, the only chance is if you can catch a glint or something, but usually it's a pretty good um, baseline here. Okay. So then what we can do... Um, oh, sorry. We can take a, take a ground-based... Um, sensor, and we have kind of the nighttime constraints here, that's kind of why it's uh, striped. In black, we have the, the sky background based on the, uh, on the time and the season. And we can take different reflectivity of our three-point meter radius spherical objects, so kind of a decent, decent sized object on the um, DRO, the distant retrograde orbit we, we looked at. And with that ground-based sensor that we located here on the Earth, we see not all hope is actually lost. We have regions where we have no visibility at all, kind of if we say 20 is our limit. Okay, there are, there are parts where we don't see anything, which is not surprising. The surprising part is even with a ground-based sensor for a large object with the decent reflectivities, we get windows where we actually see the object. Why is that the case? Because uh, magnitude is a, is a, is a logarithmic uh, scale, actually, and uh, we are only going with uh, a distance squared over the distance. So although one thinks all oh, these objects are far away, you do get ob um, visibility windows, actually, even with the ground-based, uh, Earth ground-based sensor. And then this is just a map. Oh, this one doesn't play. Okay, uh, it's a video, but... You can see it in the, in the still, we have the, the orbit here, and then if I place sensors around the Earth, kind of in a, in a very coarse binning, kind of at the center of each of those locations, kind of the magenta 
uh, dots indicate when we get visibility and the black dots indicate, okay, in that um, sampling of all the sensors around the Earth, we still get kind of blackout regions. So it's kind of a mixed bag. It's not as bad as you might think, but it's also not as good as we would hope, even if we are populating the Earth with more and more um, sensors. And this is kind of trying to turn around the object. Of course, if we have a, an, an object, we can also place a, a sensor on the object. And how much of the cislunar region do we see? So we sampled the whole cislunar region uh, with points. And you see in magenta the, the orbit itself, which is carrying our sensor. Um, we went a bit down with the object. It's only, uh, only one meter. And we have our avoidance angles. And Given we are flying a pretty big telescope, it would be a meter size, so um, that's uh, quite big for flying it. But the interesting part is we're getting kind of blackout regions, which we are now, just from how um, the constellation, um, how the sun and the moon and everything aligns. And then we're getting regions where we see basically everything in, in that region, which, which is um, pretty cool. If you're going to our Lyapunov, it's a very similar picture. We um, see the, the nighttime constraints, we see regions, okay, we get no eyes from this particular earthbound location. We get regions where we actually see the object. If we're putting that on the orbit again, you see it doesn't close because we propagated it with the ephemeris model just ballistically. You see, okay, throughout we get kind of regions where we do see the object if we are having sensors all around the Earth, but we also, especially in this one, we're having a large blackout region just here at the back of the, of the orbit, which is a pretty long time to actually keep, keep track of it. Okay, so, and now we can also put um, our sensor on that orbit. It's in the magenta again, and a very similar picture. We get regions um, of, of very large visibility in the ha whole uh, cislunar plane, and then we get regions where we are, have large dark spots where we're not seeing, seeing much at all. You see that one coming in from here. Again, you're flying a very big telescope. Please, please keep that in mind. Okay, so this is relative. Um, straightforward and brute force, right? We we're just running different scenarios and then seeing uh, what happens in selecting one orbit from that family, for example, that we know from a mission or something. But the problem is this computation is very expensive, right? You run one orbit and you run the other orbit and you run it one, one day of the month and you run it the other days. Um, everything's changing with the seasons and so on. So we only get every point solutions here, and the parameter space is vast, right? I can just take a slightly different Jacobi constant, get a slightly different orbit, or I go to a neighboring family uh, of orbits, and, um, well, you get the picture, you never see the end of it, right? So the question is, if we want to optimize that, for example, for a constellation, where, if I want to have space-based sensors, should I put them, um, how do we even parameterize that? Okay. So we need a different approach. So what we then thought about is, well, the circular restricted three-body problem is not going to cut it because we need the sun in the picture in order to give us the illumination. Um, therefore, our best choice is to go to the bicircular restricted four-body problem. Okay, so you see your three-body problem here as before, and then here you have the, the sun and you have the common barycenter. Uh, you have the satellite that you're interested in, again, saying you don't, uh, it doesn't have a significant mass, so you see the, the sun is making a circle around um, the, the barycenter of the combined system, and then the Earth and the Moon are making a circle around their common, um, their shared barycenter, the, the V1. It's, of course, an approximation, and the, the, the not-so-nice part is you're making the system time-dependent. As soon as we have the sun in it, um, the system becomes time-dependent. Dependent, but there is no way around this. So that's the, the best you can do, and then you can find kind of nice relations here. So what does that buy us? Why, why is that even advantageous? And okay, I just want to mention that you can, of course, directly put your circular restricted three-body orbits in the bicircular restricted four-body problem. If you want, you can set the gravity of the sun even to zero and just take the position, and it will just be smooth. So you don't have to redevelop your orbits, which is kind of nice. Okay, so what does that buy me? What that does is, okay, I get those angular relations that I have now, so I have a satellite I'm interested in, put that in that, and I have an observer, which can be 
the Earth, or it can be another satellite. And then I get like super simple like angular relations between them, and I can approximate my exclusion angles with those angular relations and make it like super simple and evaluate that um, pretty directly. And then I only have the limiting magnitude left um, where, where I have to um, compute the logarithm. But but it's um, now extremely uh, computationally fast. What I then can do is kind of a, what we count, what we call a visibility count percentage, is just um, super simple. We say, okay, a time step at which the object is visible, and then over the total number of time steps, and you get a percentage. And we can put all the constraints in that we that we like. Okay. And then we do a VCP single for a single observer versus all object, and then we do a VCP all, which means all observers, all object. You will see in a second why that makes uh, sense. Okay, so our simulation setup, we have the cislunar plane, we have the object parameters, again, we go to a, a meter, and then we have our um, constraints here, which are easy to evaluate now. And then here we make a comparison between the bicircular restricted four-body problem and the precise ephemeris in the things we are interested in. There are plenty of papers comparing the, the ephemeris, but we are just looking, okay, in the things we are interested in, so sun exclusion angle, moon, phase angle, and the magnitude, and you see over kind of a decent amount of time, like up to, I don't know, 20 to 30 or something, it's tracking pretty well, so um, we have to kind of pull along our initial conditions, so we never run out of that time, but it's, it is tracking um, the, the things we're interested uh, very, very well. So we're reasonably happy with that. So, and this is how it looks like now. This is a VCP single. We have a single observer, which is located here in red. We have the Earth in blue. And we did these little cylinders kind of in the cislunar plane and a bit out of plane. And you can see over an, a period of 30 days um, where the geometry would fit, for example, in March, June uh, next year, uh, you can compute the constraints and then the colors indicate um, immediately in one view how much visibility you are getting. So if you're adding all the constraints, we are kind of extremely hindered by the Earth exclusion angle. Uh, we have the magnitude constraint kind of hurting us there. We're pretty good here. And then outside here, we are, we are getting a decent, decent visibility. So we have in one view, we can already see what's going on over a given time period. We can do that for all objects on all observers. So all points in the plot would be uh, an object to observe, and we also count it as an observer. And what that shows you is what is even theoretically accessible to you. Even if I put an observer like everywhere, what can I even see? And well, what, is, what am I generally hindered by? And you see, okay, we have the magnitude constraint, we have the sun exclusion angle, you see how they are um, opposite basically, which is just, um, um, where the sun shines, and then we get a good phase angle here, which helps with the magnitude. Then here, the Earth exclusion angle, as we are um, integrating over the 30 days here, you, you see how that is uh, nicely uh, symmetric. Now, and if you put it all together, you see this region here, where we get a good um, high visibility count, everything on everything, and here we get a lower count. So this count is lower no matter how many sensors you put there, just from the, from the geometry as you're passively um, observing. This is kind of a one-view thing on what's going on. Interestingly enough, you can see that we have um, the time dependency, so if you're walking through the year, we see seasonal changes. And while that looks it's like it's only kind of rotating um, around in that plane, there's actually more going on, and I think it becomes better visibly here, I kind of um, cut out some, some slices with different angle conditions that correspond to different times of the, of the year. And you see um, even the total count kind of changes here. We are much more yellow. We get higher into the, the, the 60s here, whereas here we are staying more in the orange. So that is just a worse season to, um, to be observing at that time. So you get those seasonal changes. Um, you cannot represent them in a single view anymore as we are time dependent, but you can certainly kind of see what are the observation seasons you're, you're going into. So what we then can do is, can we make use of those visibility regions? Okay. So uh, what we then came up with is a ballistic resonance orbit, easily connecting the visibility 
and the near Earth and the near lunar region. So this is the orbital family. It's a two-one resonance orbit. The colors again indicate the different Jacobi constants. So so it's many different orbits just continuously um, uh, phasing into each other, and it has kind of that double period pattern here. So we have the, the Earth, and then the black one is uh, geo, that's indicated here. This is kind of a bit more uh, in the J2000 non-rotating frame here, so it's a bit easier to see. We have the Earth, we have geo, and then we're kind of going by the Moon um, to, to refs per, per period, and we're going by the lunar region, and we're going out to the Moon to get us uh, kind of a gravity assist, basically, to the Moon that kind of catapults us um, back. If you're putting that in the visibility uh, region here, kind of say, okay, we get good times when we when we when we are sure we see the objects here. We are phasing into regions we are interested in where we get lower visibility overall, but we want to be there in order to um, to capture as much as we can. But we also have to brace ourselves that we will be uh, less visible from Earth during that region, so we need uh, good, uh, good tracking and uh, GNC um, on board for those times. And then on the basis of that, we can design a whole constellation. This is a single orbit, which kind of, as the time progresses, is completing um, that that flower pattern in the entire cislunar region in about um, 12, um, uh, 20 periods, sorry, not revolutions going around. And then um, we, we develop some uh, uh, chief and um, follower setup that, that kind of can sweep out that region in a frequency you're interested in. So that is just an application of how you can use those visibility maps in order to design a constellation rather than um, going ahead uh, brute force and just running one orbit after the other and never, never see the end of it. Okay, so that's what I brought on um, the astrodynamics and our um, fragmentation and surveillance. Now I want to shift gears a bit and go, oh, was not the right direction and go into characterization over large distances, and we'll see how that works with the light curves and non-convex shapes. So what can we do? The objects are far away, we are not getting a resolved picture, so we can take a number of full frames here and then cut out the region we're interested in. We're getting the object detections. We can then put the object's detections together in the time series, and then we can plot that time series either over time or over the phase angle, and what we're getting is kind of brightness variations over time, as you see here, it's brighter here, 30 seconds later, it's fainter, and so on. And, of course, there's a lot of information in that light curve. The question is, how do we get it out of it? So what's happening? Again, we have the, the light that's hitting the object. It's reflecting to the sensor, as before, when we looked at um, how we detect objects. And um, what that's influenced by is, of course, the observation geometry. What's the, what's the orbit? of the object, where is the sun at that time. Um, but then if we're going into um, also more complex shapes than just a sphere, then it's attitude motion, and then also shape, materials, um, self-shadowing and uh, observer shadowing, kind of how many parts of that are visible. We'll see that in, in um, next slide. And then, of course, also the observation path, the distance of the object of the observer, the atmosphere, observation hardware, and image processing that, that, you're, that you're employing. So uh, today I will talk less about this part, mainly focusing um, on that one. So there are low-hanging fruits if we're talking um, light curves. Okay. For example, you know the object is kind of a stabilized one, and um, kind of finding panel misalignment or kind of doing a bit of fingerprinting when everything is working peachy. That's pretty low-hanging fruit. You get a good observability general. Uh, as you know the rough shape, you can kind of see how many observations do we get in order to get to the observ observability level that we want. And then you can split that up in the, in the light curve. Um, I'm not going to talk about that because um, I think that's solved, but I just wanted to, to bring it as sometimes I get questions about that. Okay, so that's kind of the low-hanging fruit. What we want to do is, well, I have the light curve, and I do not know anything about the object, and I want to know what it is. Right? So no a priori um, information. And here, what, I'm gonna, what I brought today is just shape. You can do that for attitude. You can do it <coughs> combined as well. I make the problem a little bit easier in saying, okay, we know the orbit, we know the observer location, and we know the absolute time. 
that is making the problem easier. It's also not inconceivable that you have that. You can make astrometric observations just before you do your light curve, do an orbit determination, and um, if you do not know your observer location or your timing, you have bigger problems at your observer uh, to begin with. So um, we think it's fair to assume these things and then to say, okay, what can we extract in terms of shape? We just want to focus on shape today. Uh, to, to kind of tell me what the object is. You also see the difficulty. We are measuring one parameter, and shape is a, is a high parameter game. Okay, so the first thing we realized uh, after a while working on that is, well, you need kind of sort of ground truth. You need some modeling in order to, to have some data to, to play with. And here is also is kind of a triangulation, ray tracing. You see the um, different colors. Red is the sun direction, blue is the observer direction, and then in white, that's everything is um, illuminated. Then green, that would be visible to the observer, um, but, it's, but it's shadowed. Then we have the pink is observer shadowed. Then we Blue have the kind of self-shadowing, where kind of the object casts a shadow on itself so you cannot see it. And then um, in gray, illuminate, but uh, not casting any, any light. So you can see that under the dish, for example, you see the different colors nicely. And you see how that reflects then on, um, on the light curve. That's a quite coarse model, and we know our spacecraft have very complex shapes, so we soon realized, okay, that's not going to cut it. So, what we then did is here we went to um, uh, away from, from traditional um, ray tracing and went to what is called um, shadow mapping, where we can render it on the GPU. And what you're doing is kind of a sun depth texture, kind of how far are kind of single pixels in your image plane from the sun. And can I, can I start the video again? And then rest, uh, get, get a resolution on the pixel level, and we can, of course, blow that up. And then uh, how we get the physics back into is a depth of fragment map and found via the model view projection. And then we can put in our shadow models as we um, develop that or as we um, code that ourselves. We can make sure it's physically correct and it's not as much of a black box as, I don't know, Blender or something is, where you have to have a lot of steps um, to actually make it physically correct. As we're interested in the overall light reflected, if you're having kind of fudge in there, it's going to throw our whole method off. So we cannot afford that. So that's our physically correct model. And the interesting thing is, you see that here, with the triangulation, you get kind of these errors in the shadow, as you see, you have your triangulation triangulating here, whereas here you get kind of a smooth shadow cast, and as you put that on the GPU, we are not only more precise, but also um, faster, which is always an exciting thing when it happens uh, at the same time. Uh, it's not often the case. Okay, so we were pretty happy with that, and that was the baseline for some of our newer um, developments here. Okay, so the usual method is we have an input, measurement, orbit, and EGI sampling. So that, that would be our light curve that we're putting in. What I mean by EGI sampling is kind of the resolution on the shape that you're hoping to get. <clears throat> that is, of course, linked to how many measurements you have and observability. Of course, we also we all want to be higher. Um, this is just a, kind of a spherical, uh, the EGI that we are wanting. Um, but the higher you are, the, the higher dimensional your estimation problem is. And then you can do an EGI minimization, uh, which is basically just a least squares of the measurements uh, fitted with your, with your model projected on the sphere. Hence, we have the spheres here. Look at that in a second. And you're constraining it because the areas have to be um, positive. So it's a, it's a constrained least squares. And then we need a geometric uh, step here because the distance from the, from the facet, from the center of the object is not observable, so we have to kind of uh, solve Minkowski's problem via the dual as, a, as it's shown here, and then we're getting an output shape. Okay, so a few words on that inversion process. Um, so what we're using is that extended Gaussian image, the EGI, so if you have a shape like this here, um, what that is is kind of normal vectors with associated areas to it, and an EGI exists for any shape. However, if you have shapes with concavities, like our uh, DR model here or this one here, um, the EGI is no longer uh, unique. So that, that is, is well-known and well-established. 
However, what we have um, found is our, uh, that the Minkowski closure condition still holds, which is kind of interesting. So Minkowski's condition is just if you're adding up the areas with the normal directions um, that uh, for, for kind of a nice convex object, that adds up to, um, to zero. That's a well-known fact. We had to modify that a bit because, um, of course, we have albedo area, but if you can pull that out, it still works. And um, the thing is, if the, if the objects are closed, then, um, then that still holds. It's really just for, for unphysical objects which are missing a surface or something that that doesn't hold. And that's not very well established in literature, but, but we could show that and that will be extremely helpful going forward. So the first thing we've done is on our convex optimization, we try to um, make the object, uh, the, the process more robust. So we did an initial sampling, I think the the pointer is dead. Um, we did an initial sampling here on the left. We did a first estimation with that constraint least squares, and you, s and you see kind of what typically happens. You have the normal vectors, which are kind of the lines here, that are um, close together, which accumulate areas um, in similar regions. And you see that's just an artifact of the sampling. If you had more normal vectors at your disposal, um, the, the picture would look different. And then what we're doing then is just around those regions where we are um, accumulating area that we are resampling only there. That saves us for resampling the whole sphere. And you see, we can le leave out a lot of area um, we are not actually um, interested in and we don't have the computational burden. And then we are um, re-estimating, that's on the far right, and you see, okay, we have a clustered a lot better because now the estimator has a normal direction available to it, which is actually close to the true normal direction. And then we can just um, resample and merge that. Here it was a quite simple shape. So, and, and we get kind of a clean estimation result on a much higher resolution than what we started with on, on the left here to begin with. The other thing that we looked at is that regularization problem when we want to estimate we have the normal, we have the area, and now we have to cobble that together in a shape that's unobservable, so we have to make a geometric optic, uh, a geometric um, um, uh, argumentation here, a geometric problem, and you see uh, what is illustrated in the, in the little um, GIF here is as you're varying the distance from the center, um, surfaces can actually vanish. So you have an area in that normal direction, but as you're, as you're building a, a, a closed object, um, single surfaces can vanish, and that makes the um, optimization problem very hard. So we uh, then did a lot of digging and found a new regularization um, factor that we combine with uh, the Minkowski's uniqueness problem of the closed surface, and um, that gives us a lot better convergence. So I can show that on the next slide. So um, on the left, that's kind of our naive process we had before, um, where we used a different regularization, and it takes quite a while. And then now we're kind of converging much faster when we're blue, um, kind of the darker color in indicates the um, least difference between the, the truth objects. So we are in the dark blue, which is a very good um, uh, indication. That, that we are converging to the true shape. How can we estimate that? We only know that when we are simulating. In reality, we don't know the true shape, so it's kind of a simulation. So we're pretty happy with that. So here are some of the results. Um, while those objects look pretty dull, those are actually challenging, um, challenging problems from a geometric point of view. So we have kind of our, our gem here on the top, then the multifaceted cylinder, and kind of a oddly shaped box. We have, um, you see the angular velocities that are there. We have the, the light curve. You can normalize that just so it fits nicely. And then we see our um, convex results and um, we can obtain those fast and they're very close to the truth. So we were um, pretty happy with those. Um, I think I have something coming in. Good approximation, merging, and so on. Okay. The so we feel like finally we have the convex shapes under control now that we are, um, can reliably um, invert those, which is a big step away from um, having non-robust results which sometimes work and which sometimes don't work. And the problem is, of course, in spacefaring, we have a lot of objects with concavities, right? Very few objects are actually um, convex. And then shapes with concavities are still um, problematic. So why is that the case? 
because, as we said before, the EGI is uh, not unique and that um, support, kind of that H that is varying on that one surface, is, not, is in principle not observable just because the distance to the observer is much longer than the distance of the shape to the center of the object. You, you are not able to, to resolve that. However, uh, not all hope is left because, as you can see in, in our video there, there is the self-shadowing um, that actually carries some information. Uh, if the object were fully convex, then it cannot self-shadow itself. So you would need to see that surface. Um, so there is a certain amount of information there. And as we've seen, the, the, the way is pa paved through the uh, Minkowski closure condition that that still holds, which um, was surprising to us. So what we can do is then you can say, okay, there is, if you're assuming we have a convex object, there, there must be a difference to, um, to what we predict in the light curve and the actual light curve. So can we find a measure of con concavities here? And we see in the, on the right, on, the, on that circle, that's different viewing directions on that very simplified geometry. And then we, we see regions where we get flips in, in brightness very suddenly. So can we use that as a criterion and can kind of estimate that, that phi um, down there is, is kind of the missing, missing area or the area that um, certain, uh, suddenly vanishes. So how does that look like? We, we make a convex guess, which is um, usually very close to the convex hull. And then we kind of make a subdivision along the edges, make it, make it malleable, so to speak, and then introduce our concavity criterion. And we can kind of uh, then adjust, and if we want, we can smooth it out. So we have a few, few here where we go from the convex um, guess then to kind of the, the concave guess or for concavities where we kind of just fold surfaces and, and can make that um, malleable. So those are some intermediate results. Okay. The big question is, of course, does it still work with the convex objects? Because if I have to tell it what it is, that's not really the idea. Okay. So. Here are our convex um, uh, guesses, and then non-convex, um, we see, uh, sorry for the slightly different um, display here, but we see we're, we're, we're still good. So, even, so we do not have to tell it that it's, that it's a non-convex object, we can just give it anything, and it still gives us a convex result if it's really um, convex. Okay, and then, um, sorry, that box should come in later. Um, then we have kind of our first set of simple truth objects and we see we are able to capture the larger um, concavities. We are a bit bummed that the uh, bottom one is not working out too well. That's kind of uh, something we are working on at the moment. So but it is able to capture the big concavities just with no a priori information. And if we're seeing here some, some of the objects we are, we are interested in, kind of the big uh, nozzle here, uh, which are large concavities, we can kind of get that. And once we have a go good initial guess, there are other methods that one can do to refine. It's usually just, okay, if you have no idea at all, how do you even get an initial guess that actually tells you something about the, the object? So um, we think we are the first ones who can incorporate concavities, and we are pretty happy with that. Okay, that brings me to the end. Um, if you're thinking Cisluna, the future is, is here already, Cisluna space travel and uh, commercialization also of that space is, is happening and will only become more in the future. We have very different dynamics, complex uncertainty behavior, fragmentations can basically go anywhere um, and can also not ignore it even if you're staying near Earth um, the entire time. Um, Cisluna surveillance, you can do the brute force. Um, with whatever sensor model uh, you like. We have also more compli complicated sensor models if you like, but that cannot be your starting point. That has to be the final point where you do the fine tuning of your solutions because you cannot exhaust that parameter space. We've shown kind of the, the visibility maps, which are kind of a very fast and easy way to compute. And then you can use that in your optimization, for example, a surveillance constellation or whatever you are interested in or um, your mission that has certain requirements. And then on the characterization, um, the shape inversions for objects with concavity is possible as the Minkowski um, closing condition can be leveraged alongside with the self-shadowing. And that brings me to the end. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>